legislative gridlock in Columbus. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. The legislative gridlock is not confined to Washington. It is locking things up here in Columbus. Republicans control every aspect of state government, but lawmaking is moving slowly. Animosity between the governor and legislature, animosity among Republicans in the House, and a budding rivalry between the leaders of the House and Senate are to blame. The latest example is a nearly $1.5 billion spending package that includes lots of money for schools and public works projects. The Senate has passed it, but the House Speaker says his chamber won't approve it. Jesse Balmett, what is going on? Is this just a minor squabble or is this going to balloon into a full-fledged gridlock, do you think? Well, like you said, it's really um, just the result of a past speaker fight and then a future speaker fight. And, you know, we've saw that in Washington, D.C., and a, a similar concept is happening here in Columbus. Look, I think everyone in the legislature wants to give money to local projects that local individuals are interested in, you know, making and going forward on. And so I'm sure this money will eventually be approved, but maybe after the primary. That's my, that was my question. Is the, the primary is three weeks away. We're voting now. Is that what's going on here? People don't want to give an advantage to because there are primaries among Republicans in the, in the legislature. Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly one reason why it's really the Senate has been doing its own thing and the House has been doing its own thing really for the past, you know, year and a half. And so this is par for the course. You're seeing it on things like marijuana legislation. You're seeing it on things like this higher ed reform bill. So there's a lot of things that are getting gummed up in this General Assembly. Bob, are they disagreeing on policy? Are there philosophical differences or is this more personal and power plays? It's... It has nothing to do with ide ideology or philosophy. It's all about power. Uh, it's about who's got the power. It's, you know, who's going to be the new speaker. Um, the Democrats, we've got them in such a bad situation that they want to be relevant. And they found a way to be relevant in joining with uh, Jason Stevens and 21 other Republicans. And they were able to elect him speaker. Um, the, the Democrats want some kind of power, and that's why they did what they did. Everything in, in politics it revolves around who's got the power and how are they going to use it. So, Brian, the, the Democrats happy with what's going on here? Well, it's always fun to watch mano a mano of Republicans, you know, and Republican on Republican crime here, but that's exactly what's going on. It's about, it is about power, it's not about people, and what's happening right now is Senate President Huffman, who wants to be the next speaker when he moves over, has his own slate of candidates. And the other, the, uh, the current speaker, Stevens, has his own slate of candidates. And so they're playing a game, trying to punish each other back and forth. When it's over, it will pass. But it's really a shame that Washington-style politics, which wasn't always the case, has come to Columbus. And that's what's happening here. It's just, you know, the Republican Party is fractured. Uh, it is uh, split between sort of MAGA Republicans and traditional Chamber of Commerce Republicans, and that plays into some of this. Jesse, where's the, the governor in all this? I know he, his, he had two vetoes overridden recently. Um, he's had his disagreements, but could he be a, a, a peacemaker here, or is he going to let them work it out? Yeah, I think he's going to let them work it out. It doesn't particularly benefit him to get in the middle of this fight, and there's just, like, not a lot of winners in it. So I think he is going to try to work with whoever wants to work with him on the issues that he is excited about. We have all this money. We have this super-duper fund buff, $700 million <laughs> of one-time money for projects yep. all around the state. Yep. Then we got the regular capital budget coming. Yep. Republicans have all the power. You think they'd be just, you know, basking in it and well, I mean, it's all about the, the process. It's about the process. Um, everybody's going to get their. I think everybody will get what they want for their district in the end. It's just we got to go through the mechanics of getting it done, and that's playing into all of this that's going but, on but with it, the primary. It is a bit like watching two divorced parents at Christmas time, and they both are, you know, battling over who gives the big 
Xbox gift to the kid. You know, and, I mean, and, it's a little and ridiculous. Your party's the uh, third person in that triangle who broke up the marriage. Well, well, <laughs> well, it's all the Democrats' fault. <laughs> I will say the Democrats are in this super minority right now, and the surest way to make them irrelevant is to just get a little more unified on the GOP side. All right, let's get to our next topic. Former House Speaker Larry Householder and his attorneys have appealed his racketeering conviction. They basically say the judge was biased against Householder and did lots of things wrong. And they claim the prosecution never proved the $60 million Householder and his allies received from Furch Energy to pass a law to bail out their nuclear power plants was an actual bribe, a quid pro quo. They say that they didn't prove that. As this and other cases move through the courts, the promised ethics reforms, remember them, at the State House have gone nowhere. Jesse Baumet, first to the appeal. It seems like Householder is throwing everything against the wall, hoping that one or two things stick. Yeah, I think that's right. He has maintained that he was innocent this entire time, has never really admitted any culpability for this large pay-to-play scandal at the Ohio State House. And so it really comes as no surprise that his appeal reflects that. There are a number of things he's saying that the prosecutors were overzealous in their charging. He's saying that the judge is biased because of a race that he was in, you know, a couple decades ago. And so we'll see if the Sixth Circuit takes up any of this or finds issue with any of the way this was handled. Now, Brian, they didn't put anything in writing, Householder and First Energy, which, right. of course, never happens in, a, in this type of case. But there were no envelope stuffed with cash. There was no briefcase with gold bars. No, the only cash is, you know, consumers that have to pay for this. But, but yeah. I mean, the, the Householder is arguing, I was for reforming utilities or changing these, helping these power plants, and it just so happened that he got this money from First Energy. Well, well, obviously the law, the judge, and a jury don't agree with him, and, and he's sitting in jail, so what else is he going to do? If he were smart, he would have cut his deal beforehand, as would, you know, Borges, the former Republican, Franklin County, or Ohio Republican Party chief. Uh, they didn't cut their deal, so now he's stuck and stewing in, in his own, you know, soup there. But other elected officials have won on appeal on this type of sure. case. And it's, it's harder and harder to win corruption cases for a yep. prosecutor because there is no smoking gun, no envelope with cash. And I think, Mike, didn't that happen in uh, Virginia, yes, Virginia with the governor of Virginia where that got overturned? Um, hey, I mean, he, I was involved in the last whole primary thing that happened. We just talked about it, what's going on this year. I was involved in the one in 2018. I was on the side opposite of Larry Householder. I saw this group that, that popped up called Generation Now that dumped all this money into his candidates against my candidates in the primary. That was all money that First Energy provided. Um, and then what happens? He gets, he gets elected speaker, and they pass House Bill 6. So that's not bribery? Come on. Is it just hardball politics? That's what he's going to argue. Well, he says that's just the way things are done. But you know what? Just because ways those things are done that way doesn't mean they're legal. The one thing that surprised me about all of this was the fact the feds actually did something. They actually brought charges. They actually tried them because in a way he is right. A lot of the things that were done were things that have been done for a long time. And to that point, Jesse, the reform effort has stalled. There has been really no movement on it. It was big calls for reforms when this first broke, when Householder was indicted, and we saw him, you know, in, in court. And but since then, nothing really. Yeah, I would say shortly after his arrest, there were both Republicans and Democrats, including Frank LaRose, who's now running for U.S. Senate, came out and said, let's have some transparency on campaign finance, particularly these groups that don't have to disclose their donors at the federal level, but is there some way that if you are engaging in a ballot issue in Ohio, that people will know that it's just not like citizens for butterflies and puppies. It's actually <laughs> a company that would like to influence the result of this election. And so, but really that all fell apart in part because everyone benefits from dark money. So there's more layers to this too. I mean Sam Randazzo and the folks from First Energy, they're up. They're going to have to decide whether they're going to take the, the path of householder and fight this thing or they're going to talk more about it. But 
the ethics reform issue, and, and we went through the ethics reforms in the 90s mm -hmm. over the pancake yep. scandal, um, you, you need to react so that the public has some faith in it. And I think right now, just between Washington and Donald Trump and this stuff here in Ohio, there's just a cynical voting public that thinks that elected officials are out for themselves, not for those public off is it, office holders. Is it because of that attitude, Bob, that the, the public is not demanding reforms and lawmakers can just keep things the way they are? Well, I mean, the public's looking, let, let's talk about Larry Householder and that whole thing. The public is looking at it and they go, well, wait a second, he got arrested, he was brought to trial, mm -hmm. he was found guilty, and he's in jail. Isn't that the way the system's supposed to work? Um, I don't see where they're thinking, oh, well, we should try to do something to prevent this. They're thinking more like, well, if you try to do that again, you're going to get caught and you're going to be thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily unless you're caught on a tape, like, you know, the tapes that Neil Clark had. Yeah. All right. Donald Trump came to Ohio this week to campaign. Donald Trump Jr., that is, along with former presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. They stumped for Donald Trump Sr.'s chosen candidate, Bernie Marino, in his bid to win the Republican U.S. Senate primary. The Cleveland businessman faces State Senator Matt Dolan and Secretary of State Frank LaRose for the chance to take on Sherrod Brown. Brian Rothenberg, early voting's underway. It's kind of in-person early voting is up. Absentee ballot requests are a little down. What's the enthusiasm level for this so, I mean, election? And it's mostly on the Republican side because of the Republican primary that it's up. Um, I think this election is going to be uh, down for Democrats unless they start showing up and asking for ballots at, for their local primaries. Um, you know, look, it's all about Donald Trump. This isn't about Bernie Marino. It's about Donald Trump. Um, and he won the rose. He's got the rose now, and now he's got all these people that are coming over, you know, to help him out. Um, but it remains to be seen, is Donald Trump going to carry this forward? He did with Vance, so we'll see. Any word, Bob? Has there been any talk about polling? It hasn't been very, no. very little public polling, internal mm -hmm. polling showing who might have an advantage? I haven't heard anything. I, I find it interesting. We really haven't had hardly any. I think we've had maybe one poll since President Trump did his endorsement. And it showed that Marino, who had been in third place, had jumped all the way to first. But I think it was only up by a point or two over Frank LaRose. Yeah, basically tied. So, you know, but... We've had more time and more money being spent by Bernie Marino. I, have you seen his ad on TV? It's Donald, Donald Trump, Trump Donald Trump, Donald yeah. Trump, Donald yeah. Trump, Bernie yeah. Marino. Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. I mean, smart. The, I the question that becomes, way too. when you get to a general election, if he wins, if, if Trump gets indicted, which it shows that some independents and others are going to peel off, then how is he going to shed no, the rose? Brian, how are you going to get rid of Trump's going to win Ohio by over 10 points. So the problem Sheriff yeah. Brown's got is how can he take that anchor off his neck but called the polls Joe are Biden? differently if he gets convicted. Oh, come on. That's dreaming. <laughs> um, the, uh, the all three candidates last week quickly, and Donald Trump did as well, the former president, said that they support in vitro fertilization. So that kind of, does that take the issue off the table? for this race anyway, because the abortion issue is sort of in the background of this race and heading into November. I, I suppose with them having a similar position on the issue, it's hard for you to kind of parse the differences. Certainly, um, Senator, State Senator Matt Dolan has uh, taken some votes on this that are more moderate than Republicans might like right. on some of them. And then, I mean, I guess we'll see this issue will come up in the November election, probably more than the March one. So we don't expect any March surprises here in the last three weeks, just more ads of Donald Trump endorsing Bernie Marino? And... I'd be surprised. You might see Trump come here once, but I don't even, you know, it's we're not a priority state anymore, and uh, I, yeah, he, I he'll think... be up in Michigan, he'll be in Arizona, and that's where all the fighting is going to be. Yeah, I think he, I think he'll probably wrap it up by the time we get to Ohio. Well, Super Tuesday is this coming week. Yeah, so... and I think he's going to sweep that pretty handily, so... We may or may not even be relevant on on that race. Does Marino need Donald Trump Sr. to come to Ohio for one rally to seal the deal? I don't. I don't think he does. I mean, I think the endorsement. We saw what happened last time with J.D. Vance, and um, I mean, it's a pretty powerful endorsement. Yeah. Donald Trump did come in the late late days of that campaign to to rally with J.D. Well, Vance. one thing is clear about this whole election. It's all about Donald Trump. It's not about Ohioans. It's not about Ohio issues. It's not about Ohio voters and their needs. 
everything's going to be about Donald Trump. Which right. is going to be a problem for Sherrod Brown. Not if he's convicted. All right. Yeah. Perhaps, the most, perhaps the most interesting primary uh, this year is in Northwest Ohio. It is the Republican fight to take on longtime Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. Four Republicans are vying for the opportunity. They are former Napoleon Mayor Steve Lankenau, J.R. Majewski, who lost to Kaptur two years ago, State Rep. Derek Merrin, who nearly became House Speaker, and former State Rep. Craig Riedel, who lost to Majewski in the primary two years ago. Republicans are very fearful Majewski will win the primary again and then lose to Kaptur again. And the fears became a panic a few weeks ago when appearing on a podcast, Majewski called Special Olympics athletes effing R words. Bob Clegg, you are a Toledo yes. area native. Yes, I am. How worried are mainstream Republicans that yeah. J.R. Majewski wins? Um, I think they, they went out and got Derek Marin to run for that very reason, uh, because they don't want J.R. Majewski to be the, the nominee. Um, uh, just a personal note, I was the uh, political director for the last Republican congressman in Northwest Ohio, who is the only one, and he only served two years in my lifetime, and Marcy Kaptur ran against us, and she won. Uh, the difference, though, and this is Marcy's problem with, with what's been going on, uh, that district, when she ran the first time, was 85% Lucas County. Now, because of population decline, it's 55%. And that part of Lucas is even getting more Republican, less Democrat. Eventually, she will lose. I don't know if it's going to be this year, though. She's, I mean, she's a force. She, yeah, and she's not a traditional Democrat. Back in the Perot years, Perot even was talking about making her a vice presidential candidate because of her... And, and always had that sort of strong blue collar men, you know, labor sort of support. And that translates even down in the Lima area and, and other areas of the state. Um, so, you know, it's she's just a very formidable person to run against. And that is why she has been in Congress uh, and is the dean of all women in Congress. This Majewski's comments, Jesse, have become issues in other campaigns. People are, J.D. Vance has endorsed J.R. Majewski here in Ohio. And other candidates are being asked what they think of his comments uh, about the Special Olympic athletes. And Republicans are having an answer for it. Yeah, so State Senator Matt Dolan, who's running for U.S. Senate, has come out and, you know, condemned the comments. I don't believe, as of taping, that the other two Senate candidates have done so. You're, you already had Moreno, who initially was endorsing uh, Craig Riedel, who swapped from him after some comments negative to Trump came out, and then he swapped to Majewski. So we'll see if that swapping continues. But this is the kind of problem that's going around at the country like this. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a Missouri candidate uh, running for governor that just was found to be in a picture with the KKK. I mean, it, it, the Republican Party has this really reactionary, strong right problem right now, and it's going to cost them seats. And the Democrat Party's got that anti-Semitic problem that the war in Israel and Palestine has. I don't think that's has, a fair statement. Because, yes, it is. Because well, you far right and the far left. Yeah. But getting to that Derek Barron and Craig Riedel, are they going to split the sort well, of conventional vote? That's what happened the last time, two years ago. You had uh, Craig running. Uh, then, and uh, Teresa Gavarona, state senator, running, and they split it, and that's how Majewski got the nomination. So, and now we even have a, have a fourth person in it that could even split it more. That's going to be the only way he's going to have a chance of winning that nomination. But there is a, there is a reason why that many people are gravitating to a person like J.R. Majewski or Donald Trump, right? And it's they feel disenfranchised. They feel that the, both parties have left them behind. And is that happening in, in Northwest Ohio? Well, I, I do think that there is it, there's a finite amount of people that that happens with. And I do think that part of the problem is Donald Trump has made it something no politician would ever talk about again because of things like what he did in Charlottesville. All of a sudden, it's okay to be outrageous and say these ridiculous things. But I don't think the majority of voters are going to go for it. And I think even in that district, independents are going to play a big role. What, what's happening here in Ohio and across the country is that these blue-collar working-class areas around Toledo, in Youngstown, in Cleveland, uh, are becoming Republican. 
and, the, and that's becoming the Republican base. The Democrats that used to have that now have the wealthier white liberal base. So it's almost like they've switched uh, bases uh, from what it was maybe 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, and the question is, is it permanent? That's just a Trump thing. Yeah. And that, the real question is, you know, Sherrod Brown and Marcy Kaptur have always done well with those folks. So do they peel off enough? This, uh, Jesse, this district could be a preview of what could lie ahead in Ohio. It's a very competitive district. Trump would have won, as drawn, would have won this district by three points in 2020. If redistricting reform gets on the ballot and if voters okay it, we're going to have more districts like this that are more or less toss-ups. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. This district is certainly less Democratic than Marcy Kaptur's previous district, which swept all the way over to Cleveland, the infamous <laughs> snake on the lake. And so this is a race that Republicans could be competitive in if they have the right candidate, but the last time they didn't. And so we'll see if they learn from that mistake. Okay. Since the 1960s and 70s, the transportation strategy for downtown Columbus has been get workers and their cars in and out as fast and as easy as possible. Thus, the multitude of one-lane, multi-lane boulevards. That thinking is changing, and this week the city announced a huge project to break up some of those mini highways. The Capital Line Trail would create a two-mile bike and pedestrian path that would encircle the heart of downtown. It would replace car lanes with bike lanes and wider sidewalks, separated in some cases by tree lines. The $100 million cost would be shared between public and private entities. Brian Rothenberg used to live in the Detroit area. There's the Joe Lewis Greenway, which is very similar to this. It's a bike it, path that circles Detroit. It is, and, and that's partially because our, our cities are now becoming much more residential. And even here in Columbus, not only the new buildings they've built, but some of the old buildings that that we used to visit people in from business meetings are now homes. And so it makes more sense to do it that way. Uh, and it's probably where cities are going because you can do so much from home. You can do, you can work from your car. I mean, the, the bike lane on Summit Avenue caused a <laughs> mini firestorm. Maybe it's still burning in the, in the sort of the University District, Clintonville area, Wineland Park area. This is gonna be downtown. What kind of firestorm is this gonna get? If you lose parking spaces or there's traffic's a little bit tighter getting out of town. Well, I think they, they have already said that part of the reason why they're doing this is the, the whole face of downtown is changing. I mean, we don't have the people coming downtown anymore for, for business or for offices or for work, and you have much less traffic. So what you're seeing is these parking lots are turning into uh, land where buildings or apartment buildings are being built, and like Gay Street. Um, they're going to leave enough to do two lanes, one going either way. And, and you know what? I think it's going to be more than enough because we just don't have that much traffic downtown anymore. I mean, outdoor dining really was, was kind of popular, but COVID came and everyone wanted to eat outside. And now it's sidewalks. They want these restaurants out by sidewalks now. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be an interesting concept and we'll see how it plays out. I mean, I grew up in Columbus, but I've also visited Cincinnati and Cleveland, and a lot of their downtown seems a little, like there's more life to it from time to time, and there, it's more central, you know, where like the central points of those cities are, so perhaps this adds an element of that for Columbus. Will it work? Will it spur development and bring people downtown? Well, I, I do think it worked, and it's working in some ways in Detroit. It got slowed down by the COVID, mm -hmm. um, but gradually it's starting to change. And, you know, Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cavaliers, has been doing a lot of that work in Detroit. Um, but it is starting to shift some of the downtown infrastructure. Which we don't know exactly what house is going to break down, how much public money, how much private money. What should be the ratio, Bob? Should it be? This, is, this seems like a public project to me, like sidewalks and roads. But, Mike, you know me. <laughs> yeah. I think private money should be the vast majority here. Now, I think the state is going to drop in yep. $10 million, which I think is great. Uh, I'm okay with that. But um, I wonder if... You know, in doing this, they're going to help a lot of businesses um, on Gay Street, Fourth, all that. Are the, and you know, is the city going to try to do assessments to uh, property owners or to type activity? Yeah. They or you know, because yeah. you're going to have a maintenance issue with all of this right. too. Yeah. You know, once it is built, so yeah. maybe they could go down that road. Yeah, Minnesota when they built the light rail, the 
businesses that benefited along the rail line, they have to pay a little bit more in taxes, but yeah. they also benefit from, yeah. the, from the traffic. All right, time now for our weekly uh, off the record parting shots. And Brian Rutherford, you go first. So the, the major issue this fall is going to have to be getting African-American males out to vote. Um, it's, not, it's not vote shifting. It's getting them to vote and finding them where they're at. Um, because they're not all just in the city anymore. And so this is going to be a major issue uh, for Democrats. Bob. Uh, I'm going to tell you something you already know, Mike, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, March 4th is National Snack Day. <laughs> and HubScore went out and did a nationwide survey to find the most popular snack in every 50 state, all 50 states. And number one was Rice Krispie Treats in 18 states. Number two was Doritos in 16 states, including Ohio, and I agree with that. Doritos in Ohio. Yes, Doritos in Ohio. That's surprising. Yeah. For some reason. Jesse. Uh, so uh, the group that's trying to make a change to how redistricting is done is going to have an event with uh, g former Governor Schwarzenegger to terminate ger gerrymandering. And uh, if you'll recall, the last time the governor came and took some sh shots of schnapps with Governor John Kasich when the last redistricting proposal passed. <laughs> <laughs> so he'll be back, as he said. Uh, my uh, off-the-record comment is WOSU on Monday launches a new podcast. Untangled will take a complicated topic and untangle it. This season, we'll look at the Central Ohio housing crisis. Young people can't find houses they can afford. Baby boomers find themselves priced out by rising property taxes. Hosted by WOSU's Anna Staver, it is available wherever you get your podcast, and it's on live Mondays at 11 on All Sides with Anna Staver on 89.7 NPR News. So check it out. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Continue the conversation on Facebook, and you can watch us anytime on our website, WOSU.org, on YouTube and the PBS video app. For Encrewer Panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.